is appropriate in the bill. Yeah. <laughs> um, this talk is about RF crimp connectors. I should have clarified it in the schedule. It just says crimp connectors. No bias. So we're going to start again. splices and all that kind of stuff. So um, I, I, I added the words RF to clarify. I should have done that initially. Um, this is my background. I've been working for about 38 years and as a electrical engineer and RF and microwave integrated circuit design. And I have been with analog devices, which is the world's leader in A to D converters, uh, AMD to A's. Um, and actually, I'm retiring in a week. Oh, right. So, uh, um, I am new to ham radio. I only received my amateur extra in 2014. So um, I know a lot about electrical engineering, but I'm still learning ham radio. Uh, this is an outline of the presentation. Um, we're going to cover just briefly the different types of uh, cables. And I'll make a few comments about uh, cable and connector selection. Um, we're going to look at crimp versus solder connections, which actually is a very great controversy. <laughs> there's, there's actually several controversies in ham radio, but this is one of the biggest ones, actually. Find forums that are 50 uh, threads long, and this kind of stuff. I'll give you my personal view and, and what clearly are the industry decided advantages and disadvantages of uh, crimp connectors. Um, we'll also take a look at some useful cable assembly tools that will make your job mu much easier. And if you leave this presentation with no other fact in your mind besides this, I, f I feel it will be successful. The problems with crimp connectors by and large are because people don't realize how critical the tooling is. And crimp connector tooling, crimpers and dies are not cheap. You can buy cheap ones, even good ham radio places, mostly sell cheap Chinese garbage. And uh, we're going to talk about that. But if you get a good set of crimpers and dies, the, the crimp connection is superior to some. Um, and then finally, we're going to look at a crimp connector assembly sequence. I went through this this week, step by step, took pictures, and then blew them up. So instead of showing you in real time with connectors that are only five millimeters wide, you're going to see giant blow-ups of connectors on the screen. Hopefully you'll get a better idea of what's going on. Um, this is really directed towards newbies in our hobby, but how do you go about building your own cables? Um, I should say that if you get very far in the hobby, you're going to want to build your own cables because it's just impossible to get all the cables that you, and the proper lengths that you want. Uh, without really building them yourself. Uh, it's not impossible. You can special order cables, but they'll cost you an arm and a leg. It's much better to keep a stock of cables, a stock, stock of connectors, and, and be prepared for emergencies. You never know when a connector will go bad. So how do you go about that? Well, you need to choose your cable first. That's, that's a fundamental principle. You can't choose a connector first. The connectors are made for specific cables. Long runs require low attenuation, which means large cable diameter. Short runs, on the other hand, benefit from flexibility, which is very, very narrow or, or uh, small cable diameter. So as a result, um, you're, wanting to, you're probably wanting to keep a stock, if you keep a stock of cable for building arbitrary length cables, in my case, there's a minimum of two cables I want to keep a stock of. I want to keep a large diameter cable for long runs that's got low attenuation, but may not be so flexible. Uh, and I want to keep a, a, a smaller cable, like LMR 240, for inside the shack purposes or feed throughs from the, from the panel on the house into the shack, so on and so forth. Um, the typical selection criteria you're going to use for cables, and there's, there's more than this, but these are probably some of the most important ones, are environmental conditions. Do you need the cable to hold up underground? Uh, or is it going to be inside the house and never exposed to the elements? That's a critical differentiation. Uh, the attenuation is critical. Uh, basically, you've heard real estate talked about location, location, location. Cables is pretty much attenuation, attenuation, attenuation. 
So that's a ver that's probably the most important cable parameter you can think of besides uh, you know whether it's flexible enough for your application. The flexibility and routability come into play, and the quality of shielding. When you pay, when you what you pay for, and this is true in almost any cable, whether it's a high quality professional audio cable or an RF cable, you're really paying for the quality of the shielding. That's what where a lot of the cost of the cable is at. So your life will be much easier if you can standardize on just a couple of cables and connector combinations. Because the connectors go with the cable, you know, and because it can be fairly involved figuring out how to install these connectors. They're all different. They all have slightly different assembly procedures. Um, what you can make your life a lot simpler if you just standardize on some key cables that will meet all your needs and just keep a stock of those and then keep the connectors that you need for those as well. What I'm doing uh, at my household is for long runs, uh, such as I'm centered on house grounding or an underground runs, I use Davis Gray Flex Underground Cable. It's an LMR type 400 cable. It's designed for underground use. It's got very good attenuation characteristics. It's very similar to the Times Microwave LMR 400. That's got an outer diameter of 0.405, and this is what that looks like. It's not very flexible. You, you, you can use this inside your shack. I would only use it for UHF inside the shack uh, because it's got the attenuation that will support that. But nonetheless, there's nothing wrong with using underground cable above ground. Okay, so I just standardize on this stuff. I buy a big long length of it and keep it. For short runs outside the panel to inside your shack or inner equipment inside the shack, something more like uh, LMR240 is more appropriate. This might be a little bigger than some people like to use inside the shack. I like to keep the low attenuation and LMR240 has pretty low attenuation. That's a lot more manageable. I didn't bring a sample of that, but it's only a quarter of an inch in the OD. So you choose the connector for the specific cable. Type N is superior to UHF connectors for impedance and also uh, weatherproofing. Type Ns tend to be easier to weatherproof than the, than the uh, PL259s. So connector standardization can be helpful. Uh, I keep a connector stock for the cables that I have and then I use adapters where necessary to convert my type end to say PL259 or whatever. I even do this up the tree. I run, I terminate things up the tree in type end, but my dipole antenna uses a PL259 connection, a UHF. So put an adapter on there. I throw some marine grade heat shrink over that, shrink the whole thing down into one weatherproof assembly and, and attach it and it's up there for good. Um, all connectors, by the way, need weatherproofing. You'll hear people talk about Type N being more weatherproof than PL259. That's true, but not even a Type N is fully weatherproof. You have to you have to weatherproof it yourself, and we'll talk about the best way to do that. There is no substitute for marine grade heat shrink tubing with an internal adhesive. Um, it's it's a uh, Penny wise and, and dollar foolish. Actually, it's, Harbor Freight has a really good quality marine heat shrink. Yeah. It's pretty cheap in the big variety packs. Once you learn how to heat shrink, you know, you know if, you, if you go online and look at ham radio things, they all talk about wrapping things with high quality electrical tape and so on and so forth. And yeah, you can do that. But why? Why would you do that when you can take in, in three minutes, I can put a piece of heat shrink on and it'll be good for 10 years and it won't leak. So I'm a big believer in heat shrink and particularly the marine grade stuff. Some good places to buy uh, connectors and cable are Antenna Farm, uh, DX Engineering, it's a little more expensive than other places. Yes? Antenna Farm is shut down until sometime in September, do you think? Are they really? Do they the illness, yeah. Due to an illness? Yeah, if you look at their website, great big letters. Wow. It says, That's too bad. Down. That's yeah. one of my favorite places to get one stuff. One of my favorite places. Those yeah. are really nice people. Now, if I can suggest an alternative that's about as good, if not better, than Antenna Farm, it would be our parts. I don't know if anyone's familiar with them. They're out in California. They have an unbelievable stock. 
of cables, connectors, and they have absolutely the best prices I've ever seen anywhere. Though you may have to buy a little bit in bulk from them. You may have to buy a dozen you don't connectors get to get a better price. Those, right? Pardon? You don't get involved with hard wire? No, I will when I put up my, um, I want to put up a uh, UHF uh, antenna up on my chimney, and in that case, I will go to Hardline. Um, and, and that's a specialized thing, just because I have a long run. And at UHF, that's what you have to do if you want to keep your loss down on the PBR list. So. But I haven't done that yet. I'm going to blame it on the bottom because it's 1.2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, up at UHF, even this stuff is going to be a little attenuated when you're starting to look at 75 or 80 feet up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, these are the basic uh, connector types. Um, there's others. These are just sort of the more common ones. You have full solder. In other words, you solder the center conductor and you solder the shield. You have full crimp. Both of those things are crimped. You have hybrids where typically the standard hybrid would be uh, the shield is crimped and the center conductor is soldered. Um, you also have clamp type connectors. Uh, with a solder center conductor and the clamp is sort of like a partial crimp. There's a furrow that, that comes down and into a, a uh, graded barrel interior and it sort of clamps the cable. Uh, and then you have the king of all connectors, compression connectors. And these are most used in RG6 satellite cable and that kind of thing. These things are incredible connectors. They're extremely well engineered, highly refined. They're weatherproof for decades. And they have very good SWR characteristics. They're very quick to install. There's no pieces to them. You strip the cable, you put them on, and you buy a special compression tool. Uh, so the tooling's a little more expensive. Now here's the amazing thing. I just discovered, I didn't know this, but the new trend is to start building um, Type N and other formats in compression. Now they're more expensive, they're two to three times as much as a regular connector. But if they have the same characteristics as the uh, satellite, the RG6 type cable compression connectors, it might be worth spending the extra money, particularly if, if it's gonna be 40 feet up a tree and you don't wanna, you don't wanna hire a high school student every two weeks to go fix your cable. Greg TV guy came out to my house and he, he just cut off the connectors on every cable he saw. And put com compression. Yeah, compression is. And I've always, used them. Uh, uh, and the Home Depot and Body Tool. They're they're great, and, and they, they they are truly waterproof. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. You see, you can buy that Home Depot. You can, you can get that tool at Home Depot. For yeah. Us. yeah. For I mean, us, then right. I wouldn't buy an off-brand compression tool, just like crimpers. I wouldn't buy an off-brand crimper. We'll talk about that. Um, a good compression tool for RG6 type fitting is going to cost you probably. 80 bucks, something like that, the last I looked. But because in crimp and compression, the key is getting the tolerances to be exact. Because when you deform metal, you want to deform it past the point where it's going to snap back, but you don't want to deform it so much that it never snaps back. And that's a fine line, and that's why a good set of crimpers and dies is expensive. Where I ran into trouble with that RG6 is I got some quad insulated. RG6, and I had a devil and didn't make it work yeah. because it was a little bit bigger around. Yeah. Um, there are special tools required uh, for compression connectors, just like there are for crimp. So here's a long running controversy. The staunch adherence on both sides for crimp and, and for solder. Solder people typically feel that the crimp. Uh, can be susceptible to degraded electrical contact because they don't trust a metal to metal contact. Let's face it, most of our experience, we're sticking a fluke ohm meter probe on a piece of metal and we all know you got to sort of scratch in there to get it to make contact, right? So intuitively, we don't feel like just slapping two pieces of metal together makes very good electrical contact, at least I don't. The crimp people point out that, uh, that you can have an issue of repeated stresses and flexing which causes metal fatigue and solder connect connections. And that's true. Solder connections are not going to be as robust as crimps. They also, uh, a, a problem with people who really don't have a lot of skill soldering is it's real easy to melt the dielectric when you solder the shield on like a PL259 or a Type N. So, 
the bottom line is both connections can be made well if they're done properly. The ARRL doesn't take a position on this. They basically state the truth. Both connectors can make good connections. Both types can do it. It has to be done right. My opinion is that crimp is going to be superior to solder if done correctly with the right tools. And I put right tools in, in, in big letters because it is absolutely critical. You can't buy junk crimpers. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of junk crimpers that are costing $100 to $200. Okay? So we're talking pretty expensive here. But most problems, I believe, with crimp are likely probably due to a result of insufficient uh, tool quality. Do you strip the same for crimp as you do for uh, solder? Every connector has its own strip specifications. Uh, some of them are similar, others are different. So it just depends on the connector. Um, here's what we do know about crimp connections. When you crimp something, two pieces of metal together at high pressure, and by the way, people just haven't chose these metals willy-nilly. The connector metal and the cable metal are chosen specifically to form a cold weld under certain pressure conditions, and this is what you're depending on. But anyway, a high pressure metal metal contact results in what's called a cold weld if it's done properly. And this cold weld, where it's in contact, is actually gas tight. Oxygen and, and atmosphere of gas can't get in there, and that's one of the reasons it lasts. Uh, and basically, when you fuse this metal together, you get as good electrical contact as you can get with solder, if not better. Now, a proper crimp connection is mechanically stable and particularly resistant to repeated stresses that would normally cause fatigue, work hardening, and fatigue in solder use. But if you do stresses, you can minimize it. Yes. Yeah. And we'll, sh we'll talk about how to do a crimp with some built-in stress work. Crimp connections are used commercially and industrially in countless applications. I mean, there's hundreds of millions of crimp connections in our daily life, and we don't even think about it. In fact, if you send a signal out and you have all solder connections in your shack, by the time it gets to the end observer, it's probably going to have gone through dozens of crimp connections, simply because that's the industry standard. So, to back that statement up, all you have to do is do, look at what industry and government do. Crimp connections are the standard for the auto industry, the marine industry, and the aerospace industry, aeronautical industry. You don't get into any airplane that doesn't have literally thousands of crimp connectors. And that's because they've been demonstrated to hold up under extreme conditions of environment and vibration. It's reported, uh, I actually haven't looked up the report, but I've looked on forums and people uh, who've worked in the government have reported this, that the Defense Department did a study on crimp versus sun. And they found that crimp connections have a 10 time lower failure rate than sun connections. I don't know exactly what all the background or reasons for that are, but that's, that's apparently what people have found. So here's some of the key advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the key advantages are fast and easy assembly. It is really fast to put a connector on using crimp techniques, much faster than some. It's a very repeatable connection. Uh, the quality that you get, if you do the same thing over and over again and you have good tools, you're going to get the same great quality connection over and over and over again. That can be difficult even for people who are experienced with solder. It's amenable to difficult assembly situations, like being up at the top of a tree or at the top of a tower. And they produce, most importantly, very mechanically strong connections, particularly at the shield. Now the key disadvantages are that it's critical to have a good set of crimpers. And these are pretty expensive. And I'll show you a cheap crimper here from DX Engineering, which by the way wasn't all that cheap. And I'll show you probably the minimum level of professional crimper that you would want to buy. And it's not all that cheap either, okay? It's more expensive. But nonetheless, that's just the way it is. Um, the connectors cannot be reused. That's another disadvantage. Once you crimp a connector on, it's gone, okay? It's um, hard to you can probably it. replace things, except you're going to have to cut, you're going to have to cut the, uh, the center conductor off. 
and then you lose a pin. So if you could buy a whole bunch of spare pins for crimp connectors, you might be able to reuse them. Spare pins and spare ferrules. Unfortunately, you don't see that sold very often. The people who make crimp connectors know how to make money. They don't sell any extra pins. It's so hard you're forced to, to buy the whole connector, basically. It's hard to reuse the solder one, too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You have to clean it up. It's a, it's a pain. It's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I don't want to sign up for it. So here's an example of a spec for a crimp connector, and I'm not going to dwell on this very long, but I just want to point something out. Here's a stripping spec, okay, and it shows the distance from the end to the point where you've moved the dielectric, then uh, the point where you've moved the shield, and then the length of the center conductor. And then over here is the spec for the crimp. The final crimp is a hex. Each side of the hex, the distance from one flat side of the hex to the other, is this dimension here. So the crimp furrow on the outside that would go here is at 0.429 inches. The crimp center conductor is at 0.118. And you'll find dies that have exactly those dimensions. Uh, there is some standardization on these dimensions. So here's just some basic facts about crimping. Um, I'm only going to teach three concepts because these are the most important ones. Concept one is when you crimp the center conductor, you want it flush and straight. Flush means you want the pin to go all the way back to the dielectric. No air space in there if you can avoid it. This particular pin has a flange on it. They don't all have flanges, but this one does. Uh, and so that forms a stop against the dielectric. The crimp is done right next to the dielectric, not next to the pin end of things. If you do it next to the pin end of things, you run the risk of squeezing the thing off and creating an airspace in there. The airspace will cause the impedance discontinuity. So here's a couple examples of non-conforming crimps. This is from reference to, by the way, which is a RF Industries white paper on, on crimping versus sun. But you can see here, the position of the crimp die is outside the crimp area. See how it's crimped on this end rather than right next to the dielectric? And then here, it's just crooked. This is just sort of idiocy. I don't know why you want to do that. But, you know, if, if that happens, you've got to pretty much cut it off and start over. When you're crimping the shield, here's, a, here's looking down the ferrule from the uh, longitudinal direction. So these ferrules go into the board, essentially, or into the paper some distance. So a good crimp looks like a hex. A bad crimp that's been over crimped forms dog ears. And when you get those dog ears, that degrades the quality of the crimp. Because by putting force into those, you remove force elsewhere. <coughs> Normally, the hex produces a cold well on each of those faces. If this becomes round, you no longer have the same pressure profile, and it's more difficult to get the cold well. Here's uh, the third principle I wanted to teach about crimping, and that is the concept of the shield belt. When you do crimp the shield, you want the crimp closer to the connector, and you want to leave an uncrimped portion here, which is called the belt. And if you think about it, the cable can't move in here. Where it's crimped, it's really held down. I mean, frankly, with a good crimp, even a strong guy is not going to be able to pull that thing apart, not very easily. Um, so this provides some flex and some natural strain relief. So how do we, what kind of tools are useful for, for uh, building cables and, and current connections in general? Um, it helps to have good tools. Um, a lot of people here are engineers, and I don't have to even start lecturing engineers about the value of good tools. You just, you can't have high enough quality tools. Here's a set of channel lock 911s. This is what you get in a DX engineering kit, cable prep kit. Uh, and I do have their great cable prep kits. And notice that the, the uh, edges are rounded. So you take this set of cutters, and there's a, one right here. And you get even on that big cable. The problem, by the way, with using diagonal cutters is you're going to deform the cable. And once you deform the cable in the semiconductor, it's really a pain to get them back to be round. So what you want to do is you never want to deform them to start with. So the way to do that, and there's several different tools for this, but you take this and you just apply a little bit of pressure and you just move it around and score it. 
and then you add a little more pressure and keep moving around and scoring it until you find it all the way through. When you get done, you'll have a beautiful planar interface there, which is important as a starting point when you put a crimp connector on. Another useful tool, and you also get this in a DX engineering cable prep kit, is this Exolite 170M. This is about the sharpest set of miniature cutters I've ever seen in my life. I love these things. They're great for trimming shields. Trimming spare strands off of shields or strands that are too long or what, facing off and making, making that, that uh, shield interface, that edge square. These things are great. So I recommend either getting these separately or, or buy the DX Engineering Prep Kit. Uh, here's some tools. Uh, a cable double stripper and deburr. These are actually not metal. These are sort of dielectric. They're used for stripping. A lot of times you'll pull, you'll strip a cable and there'll be white uh, dielectric material stuck to the center conductor. And that can be sort of hard to get off. You really don't want to go in there and be scraping too hard with a knife because you can scrape off any plating on the wire or you can score the wires or whatever. So you really want some safe way to strip that off of there. That's what this is for. This is also good for grabbing a hold of a thick outer dielectric and pulling it off because there can be quite a bit of resistance. So this is a good tool to have. There's also a little deburring um, cavity there that, that uh, gives it dual purpose. This is actually a very high quality deburr made by Cablematic. It has one purpose, it just deburrs the end of a center conductor and sort of flares it so that when you put the pin on, the pin slides right on. Woe to you if you whack a strand off of a stranded center conductor and then try to get a pin on there. That, you start squeezing it with needle nose pliers, trying to get it back to round, it's just a nightmare. You don't want to go there. So use a deburring tool to keep all the strands together and to bevel the end and then you can slip a pin on it. This tool, I can't say enough about. I mean, my life was completely changed in cable prep when I found <laughs> this tool. This is like the holy grail of cable prep. This is an RF industry, an RFA 4087. I don't know what they call it. They call it a cable stripper. It's such an understatement. It is an adjustable multi-blade auto stripper that does everything at once and you can Tweak it, there's little set screws, you can tweak it to get exactly the dimensions you want within a certain range. So I've tweaked mine for LMR 400 with that Amphenol connector, which I'll show you. Unbelievably fast. You can start with this tool, you, you use that tool to get a square end on your cable, then you take this tool and you go in there, it strips that dielectric, the outer dielectric to exactly the right dimension, it strips the shield to exactly the right dimension, it leaves an arbitrary length center conductor, which you just take a set of veneer calipers down there, measure it, and snip it. And you're ready to go. It's great. Literally, you can get a cable ready for crimping in about, I'm gonna say, 30 seconds with that tool. Manually, it can take you five minutes. Just got or spr minutes. Oh, spraying on the, on the <coughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, in fact, I've got it here. And after the presentation, everyone's welcome to come up here and take a detailed look. I've got one of those RG6. There's three blades in this. Yeah. And this is an adjustable one. They make fixed ones. You can buy an LMR 400 times, times microwave LMR 400 version of this. By the way, the dimensions for stripping for a times microwave LMR 400 connector are different than the Amphenol. Everything's slightly different. But the thing I like about this is it's adjustable. See, you set screws down here. I can set the depth of every blade. And as the blades wear, I can tweak it. And the blades are replaceable. I have dozens of replacement blades for this. And, and that makes it extremely good. Do, do you know about the wear out um, number of cycles yet? Or? Uh, my blades are just getting to the point where I'm probably going to want to start changing them. And I've probably done about maybe eight connectors with mine so far, eight to ten connectors. So maybe a dozen, something like that. I could probably go, you know, four or five more connectors, but I'm thinking maybe about a dozen. But I'm a very precise person. If I get a strand, if, when, you know, when it cuts to the uh, shield, it's real easy. The first, first thing you notice when the blade isn't the right depth is it starts leaving strands behind. That drives me nuts. Yeah. Even though I can strip them off really easily, with this fabulous tool, 
I'm sort of a perfectionist. So when that starts to happen, I, I start telling myself, yeah, to change these blades, please. This is a DX engineering crimper that comes with their crimp kit. And I didn't bring the kit in. Um, but this is handy, but not for what you think. This is, I think, made in China. And probably 90% of these things that you see, you'll, you'll see this type of crimper advertised everywhere. And it costs anywhere between like $30 and $100. Well, they're all made in China. And frankly, they really only have one good purpose. They're not strong enough to do shields. Not on a 402K, LMR 400. Just, it takes way too much crimping force and you will actually bend these handles together before you are able to crimp an 0402, uh, a 0.402 cable shield. You can crimp center conductors though. And frankly, I don't want to have to pull the dies out of this professional crimper just to go from, from a center conductor to a shield. So I buy the cheaper DX engineering crimper for center conductors and small shields. And I maintain the RF Industries 4009-20, which is a probably about the lowest level professional crimper that a professional would use who works in the industry for the larger things. And these are very precise dies. This crimper set costs around $580 from RF parts. Fortunately, you only make that purchase once in your life because it's pretty distasteful to do that, but that's just the way it is. By the way, if our club is interested in going to, starting to use more crimp connections, People are willing to call me up and I will be happy to lend you this crimper for a day or whatever so you can get your job done. I, in the long term, I think it might be beneficial and a good use of club funds. I haven't discussed this with any other officers. Buying a kit like this for the club and making it available to members would be a huge service, I think, really? and a great use of our funds. Well, theoretically, you could use it once or twice and yep. be done. That's right. Yeah. Seriously, idea. idea. I'm a tool guy, so I, I would have my own anyway. It's just the way I am. But this makes the most sense, because this is expensive. And, you know, you can't expect people to go off and spend super bucks on, on a decent crimping set. But the club can do that, potentially. Yeah. And then we could, we could lend it to our members for years. And everyone could get the benefit of, of uh, professional crimps. Here is the set. It's also right there. Uh, it has all the standard um, dies in it. See all these dies? I think you get five dies. Uh, and they do everything. In fact, it'll do the 0.6 diameter cable. There's a die for the 0.6, though you better be pretty strong to do that. It takes about as much force as I can muster to do a LMR 400. Crimping shields on big cables takes strength, even with a an efficient piston crimper like this. Now, I also have a hydraulic crimper for doing big battery terminals, like quadruple off battery terminals. The problem is, those are really expensive. Those are thousand plus crimpers if you get a good one. So I buy, instead I spend 80 bucks and I get a Chinese one, and it has a hydraulic power, but the dies aren't all that quality. You don't want to take a Chinese hydraulic crimper and do your RF coax connectors. That's, I try, I've tried that, by the way. I should have brought a sample of that in. It's Dog Air City with those crimpers. Not it is. Right. You see often in the literature over the years, people say, here's a way to weatherproof a cable or a connector. And yeah, Scotch 33 is great tape. Scotch makes great tapes. And they are pretty much waterproof. But they always eventually will leak because they're layered. Yeah. Why would you do that when you can, for nearly the same price, buy marine grade heat shrink tubing with an internal adhesive, which is truly waterproof, and which solidifies itself to everything. Doesn't mean you can't remove it, but you won't need to because the connection will probably never go bad if it's crimped properly and it's buried in this stuff. And so uh, I'm a big believer in marine grade heat shrink tubing. This stuff is amazing. It will shrink by three to one. Where, where do you buy yours from? <clears throat> Amazon. Where else? Um, Amazon Prime. It's at your house in two days. 
Have you ever tried uh, the Scotch 33 with uh, coax seal over? Yeah, the coax seal. Um, I have a book called Up to Tower, and I really respect that guy. He knows a lot about antenna installations, but he is a sworn enemy of crimps. He believes in silver solder. Have you ever tried to use silver solder? Sure. It's very difficult to use. Thank you. You know, it's like ROHS stuff. I mean, basically only industries can do it because it, it, it doesn't win anything. So, although he believes in that, um, he believes in the scotch, uh, but he'll tell you that, that uh, seal stuff you're talking about. That's the standard stuff you can get at HRO. Yeah, if you use It's all right, if but you if you ever have to remove it, it's a giant yeah. mess. Well, you can take it off if you have the tape on it. Yes. If you yeah. use it without the tape, Right. Yeah, well, that's long time. Yeah. He's not a big fan of that, uh, but I'll tell you, this is still secure. Why would you use anything but this? Because when you look at how this to, works, it completely seals off. Yeah. Completely seals off. Okay. Actually, I think there is a reason. If if you know you're going to take the connector off within 12 months, yeah, like you might. Is fine. Sure, that's fine. Yeah, because when you put this stuff on. Yeah, it's going to be a little messy to remove because you'll get this off, but then there'll be that adhesive down there, and you'll have to probably go in there with uh, with a solvent to clean that off, and that can be messy. But the three quarters works perfectly for the LMR four hundred. <coughs> that stuff will sh will shrink down to anywhere between three quarters and a quarter. It's amazing stuff how that works. What kind of heat can you use? Um. I have two heat sources. One is a, just a regular heat gun, which I bought from High Sierra. High Sierra. Does anyone buy stuff from High Sierra? No. It's like the uh, it's like El Cheapo Chinese stuff, but some of it's pretty decent. Uh, this Hawk uh, hot air gun it gets really hot, really fast, works great, and I think I only paid like fifteen bucks for it. So. You get in, you can actually get those from Harbor Freight too. From High Sierra. Yeah, I was going to say, High Sierra is sort of the Harbor Freight of Amber Yeah, like I said, I've got one. They work great and they're cheap. So you need the heat source and they get it right now. And then if power's not around, this big shot, whenever I buy products, I research them in dust before I buy them. This yeah. was like 5,000 ratings of five stars on Amazon, but this is a great butane torch. So between the two, you can cover your bases. Oh, there they are. <laughs> okay, here's an Amphenol Type N connector for LMR 400. Basically three pieces, the pin that slides over the center conductor, the body of the connector, and then the shield fill. So now we're just, to finish this presentation up, we're just going to go through the, the assembly sequence. And I initially planned on just doing this live for you, and I realized how in the world are you ever going to see what's going on down here on a quarter of an inch scale? So I decided I'd take pictures and blow them up, and hopefully that'll be acceptable. But you'll, you will be able to get an idea of how quickly this goes. Once you get used to putting these connectors on, you can strip and have a great connection, including heat sink, heat shrink, in about five minutes or less. So here's the starting point. We take this tool right here, and we we automatically get this length and we automatically get this length. And then this length is arbitrary and we make it long just so we don't have it too short. And then I go in and I'll use a vernier caliper in here to measure exactly the point one, 115 or 178, I forget what that dimension is. Uh, we're too far away from the amphenol spec right now for me to remember and look at it. But anyway, I trim that off. And this is where you want to deburr. To get to make it easier to slip that pin out, and that's where the deburring tool comes in handy. And don't forget the furrow. <laughs> okay, there's a penalty for that. Particularly if there's a connector on this end, it's real easy, yeah, it easy. to get to uh, get this thing assembled and realize, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I forgot the furrow, and then you cut it off and you have to start over, and you just wasted a five or six dollar connector. Same thing on the UHF. <coughs> right. So next step is. The center conductor pin is inserted and then crimped. And you see how that crimp goes all the way to the dielectric? Okay, that's step two. 
Step three is we flare this shield out a little bit. We don't have to fold it back. Different connectors have different specs. There are some connectors where you do fold that back, but not on this one. And so it's minimal work. You just flare that out a little bit so that when the body of the connector goes on, all that braid goes over the outside of the shield of the connector. Now we're ready to insert the body. And basically, you don't need any special DX engineering tools to grab on that connector and push it on like you do with some of the connectors. It literally will push on by hand in about three seconds. And you push it on until the center conductor is flush with this face. That's the spec for a type N. You want the end of the center conductor pin to be flush with that face. And that's the metric that you're looking at. And when you do that, the shield, if you cut it right, is going to pretty much be flush with this face. There's a little bit of it. But you're going to align it based on the pin. Pardon? You're going to align it based on the pin. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You want the center conductor pin to be flush, or roughly flush with so that. The shield might, mm -hmm. might be one. Yeah, the shield, there might be a bit. You know, these specs are down to a mill. I can't cut things accurate to a mill, and neither can that stripper. Okay, even if I can adjust it, the repeatability is going to be plus or minus two or three minutes. <laughs> so, and I'm a perfectionist, so yeah, that's amazing. You you learn right away what's acceptable with this stuff. <coughs> good step is a good engineering term. Step five is sliding the ferrule over and then crimping. Okay, you want to leave a bell at the end of the cable. See that bell for flexibility. Step six. Put your heat shrink in place. Typically, I'll let that heat shrink go back at least an inch. You could let it go back two inches on the cable, you know, beyond the end, the end of the cable. You wouldn't take that over the mating connector? You can. If you want to really weatherproof this connection, you'll connect it to whatever it's connecting to outside. Then you put another piece of heat shrink over the entire thing. This is just to protect the end of the connector. This is not necessarily the total weatherproofing of this thing once it's connected. It's, so you just do it's your this, antenna up on the tree. You do this routinely, every one you make. Why not? This, this heat shrink's not that expensive. And, and I can put that heat shrink on and shrink that down in less than a minute. Well, that gives you some strain relief yeah. too. Yeah, it does give you strain relief. It's a very good reason to extend that out at least an inch or two away from the connector. Because this stuff, once it's shrunk down, like this, is pretty robust, pretty stiff. Um, now, this is what makes it waterproof. See, and this is how you know when you're done. You, shrink, you uniformly shrink this down by sort of shrinking all the way around it, okay? Up and down, all the way around it. And you sort of uniformly shrink this thing down. And what you'll see is you'll see stuff oozing out here and you'll see stuff oozing out here. Can you see this? Yeah. That's the adhesive. That forms an absolutely waterproof seal. That, that adhesive isn't going anywhere for years. And my something's rubbing on it constantly. And then, of course, that adhesive is throughout the entire thing. So even if you developed a pinhole here for some reason, or maybe even a split, it could still maintain its waterproofness for years because of that adhesive. Have you ever had a case where you got through and you couldn't turn the uh, connector? Couldn't turn the connector? Yeah, I mean, it looks like it. it no, well, I only go up to this point. If you went over, you know, well, if you I mean, went beyond, you got, if you went, if you got it over here, you wouldn't be able to. It looks to like if you got close enough, you might have some ooze that would grab the moving part. Yeah, with the type ends that I use, you can easily go up to this point. In fact, you could even partially overlap this, and the connector would still turn. I think. Let's see. Yeah. No, I guess I guess you can only go up to there. So you, you only go up to the, to this point here. I'm just wondering if you've ever had that mistake. Uh, no. So it's not something to worry about. No, no, I've never had any trouble with the connector turn. So um, you're welcome to come up. I left one here without heat shrink on it. I got one with heat shrink, and this well, that is, gives that's a great connection. That, that really I mean, you you'll you'll uh, pay someone big bucks to do this custom for you on a house. But it doesn't cost you big bucks. So in conclusion, crim technology is well accepted uh, in industry and government. And 
that tells us a lot about the controversy. If there, if, if there was something fundamentally wrong with crimps, you wouldn't find them in every ship, you wouldn't find them in every auto, and you wouldn't find them in every airplane. Okay? So, that tells you that when done right, crimps are <laughs> superior. Uh, so, I hope to end the controversy with that. <laughs> Use good tools, crimp is superior. But you're comparing DC to RF. No, they're different worlds. Even RF connectors in airplanes. Well, just, There's all sorts of RF connectors in airplanes. They have to stay, withstand contraction and expansion from unbelievable temperature extremes, and they have to withstand vibration. They hold up. Yes, more you can't things. have connections going bad in an airplane. You won't find a pilot, one, anyone willing to pilot it, right? So. For the space program. Does that make sense? Does what I'm saying make sense? Yeah. yeah. Look to what the professionals do. The professionals, crimp technology is well, well proven in the professional industries. And I worked out uh, jets for 21 years and never used a solder connection. Right. You got it, Barry. I helped build a number of satellites and all we used was crimp. Yeah. That's because they hold up. However, having said that, high quality dyes and crimp are absolutely essential. This is the minimum quality of crimper I would go with. And this thing costs about $580 on sale. On sale? On sale. They have sales? Yeah, I don't know what they charge for this price. It's over $600. Oh, so you mean that's their the one for us? Yeah. In our Arf Parts carries that. And I think Arf Parts is one of the cheapest places to get all of this stuff in. Um, I believe in the Ohio principle. Not only at the office, but also in ham radio. Only handle it once. Why would I use tape when I can use marine grade adhesive and get a connection that will last 10 or 20 years and be waterproof? Why not? It's not that much more money. Consider standardizing on a few cable types and a few connector types. I don't want to have to learn how to install 10 different connectors. I have a hard enough time coming back to this like four months later to put another connector on. And I, oh, I got to pull out the directions and, you know, keep your life simple. You don't need that many different cables or connectors. Uh, and anyone who has any further questions or anyone who would like to borrow this crimper and try it out, this crimper set is welcome to do that. I'm willing to. Uh, I'm willing to proselytize for crimping in the club, and to show you how serious I am, I'm willing to lend my crimper out to anyone who'd like to try and use it. Once you do it, it's like a microwave. You'll never go back to sun. That's it. Thanks. Mike, have you sent me this presentation yet? No, no but I will. Yeah, it's a lot of good info. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Thanks.